Hi everyone, my name is Karina Shadrovsky. I am the head of the research team at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Um, I am typically based in Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I'm currently recording this from my home office in New York. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, OCCRP is a investigative journalism platform for a network of independent media outlets and journalists around the world. Um, in addition to cross-border collaborations, we provide our members with a range of resources and tools, including digital and physical security assistance, um, a global archive of research material for investigative reporting, which is called ALIF, and research support through an online ticketing system called ID. Um, that's when my team comes in. We are a group of researchers from eight different countries around the world that are on hand to help journalists in our network track down people, companies, and assets anywhere in the world. Um, in addition to my role as the head of the research team, um, about two years ago now, I led the Dubai's Golden Sands Project, which was a cross-border investigation that took a leaked property database from Dubai and used it to tell the story of the Emirate as a safe haven for money laundering and corruption. Um, I think that this project's a really good example of how OCCRP can tap into its network of journalists around the world to create a story that resonates globally. Uh, so I'm going to spend the rest of this uh, presentation kind of explaining what we did how we did it, and what we concluded from this project. Um, so Dubai was once like one of the world's most barren and hospitable lands, and in more, more recent years, it's kind of transformed itself into the extrav extravagant metropolis that it is today. Um, and as the name suggests, we've done our fair share of reporting on organized crime and corruption. And what we've noticed is that in many major international corruption scandals, Many of them have a link to Dubai. Um, it's also no secret that thousands of people have flocked there in recent years. So what we set out to do was understand exactly what it is that Dubai has to offer that makes it such an appealing place. Um, and after months of reporting and research and talking to dozens of experts, what we found is that it's actually um, a combination of a few different factors. Uh, the first is that it, Dubai is the epicenter of the world's gold market. Um, it accounts for about 25% of the global trade, and it's basically the easiest place in the world to move and sell gold with essentially no questions asked about its origin. Um, Dubai is also a hub for several different types of money flows that are, are vulnerable to abuse. Um, this includes informal remittance services. Um, there are also more than 20 free zones in Dubai, which provide a number of incentives for international investment. Um, some of these incentives include the allowance of 100% foreign ownership, uh, the complete repatriation of capital and profits, and of course there's tax exemption. Um, basically business in these zones is really loosely regulated, so it's a really easy place for smugglers to avoid customs and tariffs. Um, there's also the ease in which foreigners can obtain visas to the UAE. Um, basically. When we were doing the reporting for this project, 91% of Dubai's population of almost 3 million were expatriates. Um, and what we found was that the easiest visa that people could get was this property investment visa. Um, and basically, an investment of about 300,000 US dollars into Dubai property will buy you a residency visa, um, which is renewable every two years and extendable to family members. And with this visa, it gets you access to banking services and corporate vehicles both of which can provide legal and financial secrecy. And then there's, of course, the crown jewel and what we're going to be speaking mostly about today, which is the Emirates' booming real estate market. Uh, people aren't only flocking to Dubai to live there, but they're also buying property as a good investment. Um, the real estate sector in general has contributed majorly to the economic growth of the Emirate and also just of the UAE as a country. Um, for example, as of 2016, the construction and real estate sectors in the UAE have contributed 20% to the country's GDP. Um, at the time that we wrote this story, the Dubai Land Department reported 69,000 real estate transactions worth over $77 billion that year, and more than half of those investors were foreigners. Um, so basically, authorities have created a lot of incentives to attract investors from all over the world. And it's these incentives that actually make it really vulnerable to money laundering. 
Um, based on our reporting, we found that purchasing property there is really easy and it's, it's a simple process. Um, there are a few questions asked and there's very little due diligence done. Um, an OCCRP reporter actually went to seven different real estate agencies in Dubai acting as a potential buyer. And what they found was that most agents actually preferred cash and there were no rules or requirements before buying property as long as they could pay the price of the property in question. Um, and, you know, while it's becoming more and more difficult to move illicit money through the international banking system, as there are more and more rules and regulations are kind of um, fortunately coming into play, um, there's still very few curbs on money laundering into real estate. Uh, what I find also really interesting is that you actually have more to gain when you launder your money this way. Um, because if, it'll cost you like 10 to 20% of your total if you put your money through other economic sectors. But if you put your money into real estate as an investment, you actually can make a profit. Um, and what we also found about Dubai is that it's not only about turning a blind eye and um, refusing to ask questions about the origin of money. We've actually found blatant examples of real estate professionals helping their customers launder cash. Um, in one example, a former representative at one of Dubai's major property development companies in Dubai told us that his organization engaged in these fake deals to help their customers launder money. Uh, the way that it worked is that a client would walk in carrying a bag of millions of dollars. They would then uh, buy property and then weeks later cancel that transaction. Um, and then the refund would actually come through a bank, which essentially just cleans that money. Um, and, you know, development companies, it's in their interest to do this because in this case, the clients actually pay um, a commission of like 30 to 40 percent. Um, five percent goes to the broker, one percent to the salesman, and the rest of the money just goes to the owner of that development company. Uh, so obviously, all these features combined make Dubai a really attractive place for anyone who wants to park large amounts of money. Um, and on top of all of it is the Emirates penchant for secrecy. Um, there's no public land registry, so you can't. No one can go and check who owns property there. Um, and that's why I think that this project and this leak that we got was so valuable and important. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk to you a little bit about the leak that we got um, and what it contained. Um, a nonprofit organization in D.C. called C4ADS gave it to us. It was a group of spreadsheets, pretty much, um, that was maintained by real estate professionals of property and residency data. Um, like I said, there's no official record of this. So this is basically the closest you can get to seeing who owns property there. Um, this specific leak was maintained between 2014 and 2016. Um, and it contained 54,000 addresses, uh, the names of 129,000 owners, both current and previous. Um, basically, the data sets... Most of them were for real estate um, developments, but some of them were actually documented land sales. So it actually lists the name of the buyer and the seller. Um, and these people were identified themselves as being from 181 different countries around the world. Um, I'll get a little bit more into the data later, but I just wanted to give a quick overview then. Um, and after going through all the data, uh, what we found is that a list of names that basically proved the open secret that the lack of transparency, light regulations, and seeming disinterest in the origins of the money that ends up there have made Dubai a haven for people who want to hide their money. Um, some of the names include criminals, such as Othman Al-Baluti, who allegedly runs a cocaine import business from the Belgian port of Antwerp. There were sanctioned individuals like Rami Maklouf, who is the cousin of Bashar al-Assad, who was sanctioned in 2008 for benefiting from corruption within the Syrian regime. Um, and there were politicians, such as members of the ruling family of Azerbaijan, the Aliyevs. Um, basically, this confirmed what we already knew about the Aliyevs based on a 2010 Washington Post report that claimed that um, Ilham Aliyev, the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev's children, Haidar Aliyev, who was 11 at the time, and his sisters, had bought 17 properties in Dubai that was worth $86 million. Um, so this database basically confirmed that. But what it also showed us was that the Sofitel Hotel, which was locate, which is located on Palm Jumeirah, was owned by a Dubai-based company called Sara FCO. 
Um, and what we actually learned from a previous investigation called the Daphne Project, which was a collaboration of 18 news organizations that basically set out to continue the work of Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galicia, who was killed by a car bomb in 2017. Um, and as part of that project, journalists were told that that company in Dubai, Sara, was jointly owned by Leila and Arzu Alieva, the two daughters of Ilham Aliyev. Um, and besides that, Sofitel Hotel, this database also showed that Sara owned 16 villas on the nearby Jumeirah Island, where villas cost an average of, of $2.5 million each. Um, and I wanted to specifically highlight this case of the Aliyevs because, um, you know, while they're stashing millions of dollars into real estate abroad, they have this known history of forced evictions in their country since 2009, um, where basically hundreds and maybe even thousands of families have been displaced in their homes, oftentimes without much warning and rarely ever with fair compensation. Um, a prime example of this was in 2011 when Azerbaijan was preparing to host a Eurovision Song Contest. Um, they basically took this as an opportunity to boost their image on the world stage. And, you know, as part of this, they built a 25,000 seat concert hall for the event. Um, and to do so, they kicked out 281 families from their homes uh, to make way for construction that was directly linked to Eurovision. Um, and the compensation, according to a report from Human Rights Watch, was like several times below the market price. Um, and that's just one of many examples of these forced evictions in Azerbaijan. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, back to the project that I was talking about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did it, right? And kind of step by step how we um, went through this process. So first, we obtained this data from C4 ADS in the form of dozens of spreadsheets, like I had mentioned earlier. Um, each spreadsheet was for a property development in Dubai. Uh, the biggest challenge here was that each spreadsheet was actually formatted differently. Um, the columns were in different orders. Some of them contained prices of the property. Some of them contained sizes of the property. Um, but basically, it wasn't consistent at all. Um, but what almost all of them actually contained a property code uh, for the property in question, the name of a resident or owner um, of that property, some sort of contact information, um, and in many cases, the nationality of that resident or owner in question. Um, so this is when our data team kind of came in to help. And what they did was they took the nationalities and created separate country spreadsheets. Um, so each spread, each country basically had its own spreadsheet of residents in Dubai that were from that country. Um, and we took those country spreadsheets and distributed them to our partners around the world who are familiar with names of people of interest. And they went through the data manually and sent back to us names of people that they thought were potentially interesting. Um, on top of those names, though, there were also still thousands of names that didn't have a nationality listed. Um, and there was just way too many to go through manually one by one. Um, so again, our data team took this list and what they did was they cross-referenced it against some interesting data sets that we have in Aleph, which is that global archive of data that I mentioned in my intro. Um, some of these data sets included PEPS lists, sanctions lists, um, Interpol's most wanted lists, etc. Um, and that was kind of a good way to narrow down some of the names and find some interesting people. Um, and then there are also some cool examples of what local journalists did in their own countries. Um, our Norwegian partners, for example, went through that list of names that didn't have a nationality listed, and they searched for little indicators of people that were from Norway, despite not, not having listed that as their nationality. So they searched for phone numbers that started with plus four seven, which is the country code for Norway or for email addresses that ended in .no, or for addresses that had zip codes in major Norwegian cities. Um, and by doing that, they actually came up with a pretty long list of Norwegians who didn't actually list their nationality as Norwegian, but were in the data nonetheless. Um, so yeah, after sending it to member centers, scrape, um, cross-referencing the data through our data sets, 
we ended up with a list of about 500 names of potentially interesting people. Um, and that's kind of when the data part of the project ended and the research part began. Um, and it was a pretty difficult process. Um, you know, we couldn't just publish this list of names of 500 people. What we had to do was confirm that these were people who we thought that they were and not just someone with the same name. Um, so we embarked on this months long research initiative, basically using the data that we had, which was the phone numbers, email addresses, and home addresses provided in the data to confirm who these people were, who we thought. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this, this contact information that was in the data itself belonged to the real estate agents who actually helped them purchase the data. Um, but in a lot of cases, these, this identifying information proved to be extremely valuable. Um, we ran it through a bunch of databases and did a lot of open source research to basically confirm that these people were who we thought. And what we ended up with was a list of 100 criminals sanctioned individuals and politicians and their relatives that we confidently published um, that we know sought refuge in Dubai. Um, we also gave all of these people the right to reply. Uh, we reached out to every single one of these people, you know, uh, explaining that this is the information that we have and, you know, we have this, we know that you own property here and, you know, et cetera. Uh, usually it's put us in an interesting position because usually when we have a leak like this, we kind of, um, can go to them with confidence. But in a lot of these instances, we were, knew that it was someone with the same name, but we weren't actually sure that it was them. Um, and if we didn't get confirmation from them, unfortunately, we just couldn't then publish the data that we had. Um, but anyway, like I said, we ended up with a list of a hundred people that we published as an interactive map, uh, that shows where in Dubai, they own property and a little description of who they were and why we thought they were of interest. Um, and in addition to this map of property and this database, we also published multiple stories that kind of went into more detail about some of our findings. Um, I provided the links to all of them at the end of this presentation, but I'm going to briefly just explain, uh, mention one of them. Uh, our partners at Finance Uncovered in the UK found properties connected to the former Nigerian oil minister, Daniel Etete, who is facing various corruption charges in connection with a 2011 deal known as OPL245, which involves Royal Dutch Shell and any of Italy. And investigators have spent years trying to figure out where hundreds of millions of dollars from this deal have been stashed. And basically, Etete's name on this list suggests that he may have actually used his share of the $800 million he got from this scandal to buy two luxury properties in Dubai. Uh, another cool example that I wanted to highlight, um, basically just to show that, as with many data sets that we get at OCCRP, um, we're actually able to keep uncovering more stories after the initial project that we published. Um, so in this case, at the end of last year, we published a story with our partners at RFERL and OCCRP Member Center Kloop uh, about an underground smuggling operation in Central Asia, which implicated the former head of customs in Kyrgyzstan. And basically, a whistleblower had described this operation in detail and provided troves of supporting documentation to back up his claims. Um, and one thing that he told us was that Dubai, he pointed to Dubai Investments as further evidence that the Abdul Qadir family, which is the ringleaders of the smuggling operation that's the center of the story, and Kyrgyz officials actually worked together. But in this example, he actually didn't have any evidence to back up his claims. But luckily, we had this database of property ownership in Dubai. And what we found in it was that the wife of the customs official and the Abdul Qadir family were actually co-investors in a five-story building in Dubai. Uh, this was actually the first documented proof that the two families were ever in a formal business partnership together. Um, and in this data, we also found additional properties in Dubai that were linked to the wife of the customs official that were worth a total of $12 million, uh, which is way more than a Kyrgyz customs official could typically afford. Um, so yeah, so in addition to all the really cool projects and stories that came out of this data, I wanted to point to some of the concrete uh, impacts that came out of it as well. 
Um, in one example, in Ar Armenia, our member center had connected luxury real estate in Dubai to Armenian government officials. And the prices of this property was at odds with their positions and the known salaries that they made. Um, days after they published this article, the head of the Department of Economic Security and Anti-Corruption at the National Security Service there reached out to them asking for more information. And a few months later, they also received the same type of request from the police there. Um, though they didn't have any extra information to give them, what this told them was that, you know, authorities were actually reading their story, paying attention and following up. Um, and this February, they actually learned that prosecutors launched a criminal case against one of the officials that was the subject of their story. Um, and they're looking into, they're investigating him for reporting false information and hiding data subject to a declaration. Um, and in Norway, another example of impact, um, our partner on this project, Dag Blodet, who I mentioned had harvested the data for all Norwegians, they revealed that millions of dollars in investment and rental income were concealed from tax authorities in Norway. Um, what they found, they FOIA'd um, tax authorities in Norway, and what they found was that only 40 properties in the UAE were reported to Norwegian tax returns in 2014. But in the data that we had from Dubai land ownership, there were more than 80 properties linked to Norwegians just in the Emirate of Dubai alone. So they published the story, and since publishing in January 2019, tax authorities told them that more Norwegians have actually been coming forward to report their property abroad, several even in Dubai. Um, and then just one more piece of impact that I kind of really want to highlight is comes out of the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, which is a strategic partnership between Transparency International and OCCRP that has the purpose of combining investigative journalism with civil society engagement to kind of get the most impact out of the stories that we do. Um, and in this case, based on the investigation that we published on Dubai, Transparency International called on Dubai authorities to clean up the real estate sector, and they issued a series of recommendations to authorities in the UAE. Um, you can find all of the recommendations, again, in the link at the end of this presentation. Um, but one of the recommendations that I kind of just wanted to highlight was the importance of open land and beneficial ownership registries, which are databases holding information on who controls and benefits from certain companies. Um, and, you know, making this information public uh, is a really important step in decreasing the risk of money laundering in places like Dubai. Um, if people knew that the public could see who owned this property maybe they wouldn't be so quick to go and purchase it in the first place to hide their money. And the last thing that I just wanted to end this on is a really new and major development um, on this topic, which is at the end of last month, at the end of April, the Financial Action Task Force published a really damning report on the UAE claiming that the country has a lot of work to do when it comes to combating money laundering and terrorist financing. And, you know, this 300-page report basically confirms what we said in our story, what TI and other activist organizations have been saying, which is that the UAE plays a major role in global money laundering. Um, and they basically concluded that it's a combination of many different factors that expose it to money laundering and terrorist financing abuse. Um, and, of course, one of the weaknesses that they highlighted was the UAE's booming construction and real estate sector. Um, and the biggest point that they raised in relation to the real estate sector is the lack of suspicious transaction reports coming out of this industry. Um, they basically said that the banking and money transfer services, there are more and more STRs coming out of the banking and money transfer services. Um, it's been increasing over, the, increasing over the years, but there's still a really limited number um, coming out of the real estate and precious minerals and stones trade. Um, but these are two really important and high-risk sectors. So the amount of STRs coming out of there are just really not in line with what authorities suspect to be realistic. Um, and this lack of STRs is really limiting the financial intelligence that's available to authorities that are investigating money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, so yeah, it's a really long report. Um, but I think that what it does is that it confirms what we concluded in our project, which is that Dubai really, the UAE and Dubai specifically really acts as this one-stop shop for the world's corrupt. 
um, offering many different services that make it that are really easy to exploit. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um, here's a list of links to all the stories and reports that I mentioned throughout and my contact information at the end. Uh, if you want to reach out and have any questions about Dubai, and also if you or your someone from your organization is interested in taking a look at some of the property ownership data that we have, please let me know and we can see if we can get you access to it. Cool. Uh, yeah, so thanks for listening.